Welcome physics people to another video from Juddy Productions. In today's video we'll be looking at torque and rotational equilibrium. Okay, let's start with torque. It's got the symbol tau from the Greek alphabet. And by definition, torque is the turning effect caused by a force at a distance from a pivot point, and it is a vector as well. So let's consider these terms. So first of all, to create a torque, you need a force being applied. If we imagine a shifting spanner, and we're applying a force downwards, that's our force. It's operating a distance from the pivot point, which is where the nut exists. So the force is not applied on the actual nut itself, it's applied at some distance along the handle of the shifting spanner. And there's our pivot point. So once we've got a pivot point and a force being applied by a distance, then we get a torque or a turning effect. Nice effect. So a torque is a vector quantity, as we mentioned, which represents the turning effect created by a force which acts at a perpendicular distance from an axis of rotation or pivot point. And so the radius has the following symbol. It uses R and then the little subscript perpendicular, the geometric symbol. And torque is measured in Newton meters. So here's our fundamental standard arrangement. We have a force F being applied at a distance from a pivot point. And the equation we use is torque is equal to the radius multiplied by the perpendicular force. There are variations of this. So you could have a force being applied at an angle to that particular radius. In this scenario, let's consider the force components, both horizontal and vertical. So the angle we have here, theta, is equal to the angle formed between the force and the radius. We can use some trigonometry of a right angle triangle to realize that the vertical side is equal to F sine theta. Now, this looks similar to our previous diagram, whereby we have a radius and a perpendicular force. So when a force is operating at an angle to the radius, we use the following equation. The torque generated is the radius times the force multiplied by the sine of the angle theta, where the angle is shown in our diagram. In the second scenario, we get exactly the same effect. We have a force that's not perpendicular to the radius. So we break that into its components, horizontal and vertical. The angles are exactly the same. And again, using Pythagoras, we know that the opposite side length will be equal to F sine theta, where F is the main hypotenuse. So once again, we have the equation, tor the torque is equal to R the radius times F the force multiplied by the sine of the angle theta. Let's try some simple examples. Example number one. So we want to find out what is the torque in this situation. We've got a radius of 0.3 of a meter. Let's make certain we don't leave our units in centimeters. Force is 10 newtons and it's perpendicular as can be seen. So we can use our simple equation. So torque is equal to the radius times the force. 0.3 times 10 gives me three newton meters. Example number two, we're asked to find the torque. We have a radius of 0.2 of a meter, getting our units correct from centimeters to meters. Our force is 30 newtons and our angle to the horizontal is 30 degrees. This time we use the following equation. Torque is equal to the radius times the force times the sine of the angle theta. We substitute our values in, make certain our calculator is in degrees, not radians, and we end up again, coincidentally, with a torque of 3 newton meters. Our final example, we're asked to find the torque. We have a radius of 0.15 of a meter. The force being applied is at 50 newtons, and it's being applied at an angle of 50 degrees. Here's our equation. Torque is the product of the radius and the force and sine of the angle theta. We substitute our values in, and we get an answer of 5.7 newton meters. These examples are all pretty straightforward, but show you how to apply the various equations to calculate torque. Let's look at a new scenario. Consider two identical twins playing on a seesaw. Richard wears red and Bob wears blue. Okay, these guys have got a nice balance happening at the moment. Let's consider the physics. So our first task is to identify the fulcrum or the pivot point in this system. Now, most people work this out pretty straightforward. It operates right in the center of the seesaw where it's got a base of support. Task number two, identify the forces operating on the seesaw. Now we're going to make the assumption the wood beam is massless to make this equation a little bit easier as a starting point. So the red twin, Richard, has a gravitational force pulling him down towards the earth. That's applying on the seesaw. Likewise, Bob has a gravitational force pulling him down towards the earth, and that's also applying on the seesaw. And there is a reaction force at the base of the seesaw pushing up. Now, in translational equilibrium, which is a fancy word for saying we have a balanced net force of zero, we find that the forces left and right are equal. We have no forces left and right in this diagram, so that's kind of irrelevant. 
and we also find that the sum of the forces up are equal to the sum of the forces down. These fancy symbols are representing capital sigma summation. It means the total of. So in terms of this scenario, the only force up is the reaction force, and the two forces down are the force due to gravity on Richard and the force due to gravity on Bob. So there's our statement for translational equilibrium. Task number three, identify the torques operating on the seesaw. So let's look at this system and work out what torques would generate a clockwise torque. Now torques are easier to reference from a fulcrum in terms of either clockwise rotation or anti-clockwise rotation. So in this scenario, which of the twins, Richard or Bob, would be generating a clockwise torque on this system? Bob operates at a radius from the fulcrum and there's a downward force due to his gravitational force. That combination, if he were the only person on this seesaw, would make this whole seesaw rotate in a clockwise rotation. His end, if he were the only person on this seesaw, would go downwards, and the opposite end would rotate upwards. The torque due to Bob's gravitational force generates a clockwise rotation. On the other hand, his brother Richard, he has a radius from the fulcrum, and he generates a gravitational force towards the ground as well. Now that combination of radius and perpendicular force generate a torque which would make the system rotate in an anti-clockwise manner. If Richard were the only person on this seesaw, then definitely his side would go down and the other side would go up. Because we're describing things referenced to the fulcrum point, we talk about rotating in an anti-clockwise direction. So there's our two torques. Bob in the blue generates a clockwise torque and Richard in the red generates an anti-clockwise torque. Now in a balanced scenario, not only are the forces up equal to the forces down, and we call that a translational equilibrium, but also the net torque is zero, meaning that the sum of all the torques in a clockwise rotation are equal to the sum of all the torques in an anti-clockwise rotation. That also allows us to make calculations. So we know that the torque from Bob will be equal to the torque from Richard. And that's a product of the radius and the gravitational force. So let's look at this scenario. The twin's father, Barry, replaces Bob on one end of the swing. So, here's Big Bazza. He's a big buffer. Richard is located two meters from the fulcrum and has a mass of 40 kilograms. What distance from the fulcrum will Barry, with a mass of 100 kilograms, need to sit in order to balance the seesaw system? Richard has a radius from the fulcrum of two meters and has a mass of 40 kilograms. His dad is at some position from the fulcrum, some radius that we have to calculate, and Barry has a mass of 100 kilograms. So rotational equilibrium is where the net torque is equal to zero. So to achieve this, we know the total clockwise torque must equal the total or the sum of the anti-clockwise torque. So the torque generated from Barry must equal the torque generated by his son Richard. So Barry's torque is his radius multiplied by his gravitational force, and Richard's torque also is his radius multiplied by his gravitational force. So put those numbers in. The radius for Barry is the unknown. And to work out the force, it's his mass of 100 times 9.8. That's his gravitational force. Whereas with Richard, we do know the radius is 2. He has a mass of 40. And again, multiplying that by 9.8 to get it to a gravitational force. The most common mistake that students do is to put mass in the equation and not multiply it by gravity to calculate a weight force but it's really important to note. Torque is not the product of radius perpendicular to mass, rather it's the product of radius perpendicular to the force. So if we simplify the right-hand side, we end up with the radius of Barry multiplied by 980 equals 784, and then we can further simplify that to find out that the radius that Barry needs to sit at is 0.8 of a meter. So Barry would need to sit 80 centimeters from the fulcrum to establish rotational equilibrium, or in simple terms, to balance the seesaw out with his son, Richard. Our final question, scenario three. A hiker sits on a fallen tree trunk that spans a small creek. Here's our hiker sitting on a tree trunk, banks of the creek on either side, and water down below. She's sitting at 1.5 meters from the left-hand side of the trunk. The hiker is of mass, 90 kilograms, and the branch is of mass, 250 kilograms. The normal forces on the side of the creek acting on the trees are N1 and N2 as shown below. What's the magnitude of the force N1 and N2? So these two normal forces are the ground pushing up against the left end of the tree and the right end of the tree. So first of all, let's look at this in terms of forces. We've got a normal force one pushing on the left-hand side of the tree, 
we have a normal force 2 pushing up on the right hand side of the tree. We have the hiker's gravitational force, I'll just call that FH, force of the hiker, pushing down. And we also have the gravitational force of the tree, FT, pushing down. Now interesting to note, whilst the tree itself is 4 metres long, the centre of mass we take to be the geometrical centre at a distance, or a radius rather, of only 2 metres, right in the centre. So let's look at translational equilibrium with a net force of zero, because this high country is not moving up and down left or right. So the sum of the forces to the left must equal the sum of the forces to the right. In this scenario we have no sideways left and right forces. We also know for translational equilibrium and net force of zero that the sum of the forces up must equal the sum of the forces down. So let's look at this. In terms of forces up, the arrows pushing up are the normal force 1 and normal force 2. So the sum of the forces up is force normal 1 plus force normal 2. In terms of the sum of the forces down, from our diagram we can see that there's a gravitational force due to the hiker and a gravitational force due to the tree, both operating downwards. So we can write that out as a statement. The sum of the forces up is equal to the sum of the forces down. We can sum in our values. We know the hiker's mass to be 90 kilograms, and we know the mass of the tree to be 250 kilograms. We know the sum of the two downwards forces will be 3332 newtons, and that will equal to the sum of the normal force 1 and normal force 2 that are forcing upwards. Let's label this equation 1. We'll use this again in a minute. Finally, let's look at the rotational equilibrium, where the net torque is equal to zero. So first of all, in order to analyze a torque, we need a pivot point or a fulcrum. It may not be as obvious in this system what to use, but I'm going to take N1, the point where the normal force reaches the trunk of the tree, as my pivot point, and I've highlighted that with a red dot. Now, let's look at how the system would rotate around that red dot. So we want to consider, we want to consider the sum of the anti-clockwise torques and the sum of the clockwise torques. After all, this is in equilibrium. The system is not rotating, so they must be balanced. So in terms of the system generating an anti-clockwise torque, if this is our pivot point, this force is pushing downwards, that would make the whole system, if it were the only force, rotate clockwise. The force of the tree would make it rotate clockwise. Ah, this one, the normal reaction force, N2, is pushing upwards. And if that were the only force locked into this pivot point, the whole tree would rotate in an anti-clockwise direction. So the sum of the anti-clockwise torques is generated by the torque from force N2. On the other side of our arrangement, we find that the gravitational force of the hiker is generating a clockwise torque, as is the center mass of the tree trunk. So the sum of clockwise torques is the sum of the torque generated by the hiker plus the torque generated by the center of the tree. Let's fill in our values. So the radius from the pivot point to N2, from the pivot point to N2 is 4 meters, and that's subbed in. And we go over to the hiker who has a mass of 90. And we must remember to multiply that mass by 9.8 to convert it to a weight force, and they have a radius of 1.5. So you can see the hiker is located 1.5 from our reference pivot point at N1. The tree has a mass of 250, it must be multiplied by 9.8 to convert it to a gravitational force, and it's located at a distance, or rather a radius, of 2 meters from our reference point. Here's our reference point, center of mass is half of this 4 meter total span, which is 2 meters. As we just mentioned, the torque is not the product of the radius perpendicular to the mass, but rather the radius perpendicular to the force. Keep remembering this as you put your values in your equation. We can simplify that. When we divide 6223 by 4, we can calculate the force of the normal 2. It comes out to a value of 1555.75 newtons. You would recall earlier with our translational equilibrium, we came out with this equation, equation 1, which states the sum of the two normal reaction forces must equal 3332 newtons. We can now substitute in our value for N2 that we just calculated to determine that N1 must have had a force of 1776.25 newtons. So the answer to this question, the magnitude of forces N1 and N2 are 1776 newtons and 1556 newtons respectively. Always check our values and see if this makes sense. N1 has a higher force of 1776 newtons than N2 does, which has a force of 1556. Clearly that makes sense because the center of mass of our whole system, which includes the tree and the hiker, is closer to N1. So you'd expect N1 to have to compensate with a higher reaction force than would N2.
You've been watching a Juddy Productions video. If you've enjoyed and indeed learned something from this video, then please remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.